This is the bike that I converted from gas to fully electric. It's a 1976. It's a Yamaha DT125. So it's a dual sport bike. So it was originally designed for road and dirt trail use. Up front, I didn't change anything. It's still got the stock drum brake and brake lever. I did rebuild the fork because there was no damping in it whatsoever. In the rear, I took out the stock rear hub because it had a chain drive on it. And this is not chain driven. This right here is the motor. It's a 72 volt, three kilowatt motor. This is the power that feeds directly into the motor. This part's axle stays stationary and the whole wheel spins around it. So you can either, when you make an electric motorcycle, you can either use a motor with a chain drive to get more torque or um, go with a hub like this where it's a direct drive in the rear. Um, I went with this option because you can see it's like a trapezoidal shaped area here. And if I put a motor there, I would have almost no room for batteries and the heaviest component would be up off the ground on the CG. So this allowed me to have all this space for batteries here. A downside to that is now I have a 40 pound hub that's unsprung mass with the suspension. So it does ride rough off road, which you really probably wouldn't want to be doing anyways with an electric motorcycle in terms of puddles and stuff like that. So this is now just a mainly street bike. I also got new rear shocks for this. So to get this hub to work, I had to modify the swing arm here. I had to cut out a slot here because this axle on the hub is not removable. So I had to cut a slot out to be able to slide it in. So then after that I built a little torque arm bracket to kind of retain it so that it can't pop out the back end. Likewise, I did the same thing over here. Cut the slot out so I could put the axle and put the torque arm there. This side is actually an upgrade. There used to be a drum brake in here, actuated, actuated by the foot pedal. I removed all of that, and now I have, since there is no clutch anymore, um, the left brake breaks the rear. This is, it breaks very well now. I had to, all I had to do was weld a little pin here for the bracket for the caliper. And then the rest of it just slid right through the axle. So that was quite easy to mount. I was able to take out the engine, the exhaust, the air box, all that stuff. I left the original toolbox in here. That's kind of cool. But here I have the batteries, which are fully sealed. There's two um, battery packs in here. Overall, it's 21S, so like 76 volt, 47 amp hour. They're Ford automotive cells. Um, with all that battery, this thing has a range of about 50 to 60 miles, which is really good. Here is the controller. The controller takes the DC voltage from the battery, turns it into AC to run the hub motor. This is my onboard charger. So if I ever want to charge anywhere, I have this Velcro so it doesn't fall off. Um, any outlet anywhere, this will charge. It's a one kilowatt charger. It'll charge the whole battery in about four hours or about 15 miles per hour plugged in. And then here is the DC to DC converter. It converts the 72 volt battery down to 12 volts so I can run my accessories. So it's running on the original headlight, the original key switch, the original speedometer, and the original brake light. So I was able to keep all that 12 volt wiring. What I did have to change is this key switch now controls, you can see in there, that's my main contactor. So the 12 volts on the key switches this high voltage, which gets the battery active and turns on the controller. So I did have to add that into the circuit and I had to add this into the circuit. Uh, honestly, the hardest part of this pole project was this battery. 
I can make a whole another video about how I did all this, how I put the cells in, got them in series, routed the BMS, and then coming out of the top of the battery, all I have is a negative post, or this is a positive post, and a negative post over here, and then a charger port. So it's all sealed, I pass directly through the wall, it's all sealed and siliconed up, so no water will get in there. And coming out the front here, I have a data cable for my display, which I'll turn on. So this display is a touch screen, which is pretty cool. It tells me my voltage, the current I'm currently drawing. Since I'm not riding right now, it's not telling me how long I have till empty. It gives me the temperature. Second page tells me how much capacity I have remaining. How many times I've cycled the battery. Then all my individual cell voltages. Um, the seat is original. The gas tank um, doesn't do anything. It's completely empty. So that could be changed into some sort of storage. Right now it's just an old, smelly, rusty gas tank. But I left it on because it looks super sweet with it. Without it, it would look really weird. Um, this is just a cover to cover up. My contactor. Then on this side, oil tank still, it's also doing nothing, purely aesthetic sitting there, but it really puts it all together. And so to turn the bike on, I just turn the key switch. You can hear that click. That is the, the contactor in there. And now the bike is live. It moves. Just like that. So that's another thing with the rear hub. It's completely dead silent when it moves, which is kind of cool. You can hear a lot of things around you. There is no chain running, so you don't need to worry about lubricating a chain, and the chain can get really noisy sometimes. Uh, the chain also has inefficiencies. You probably lose about 20 to 30% on a mechanical chain. So I do get more range because of this. And then I took the, off the original carbureted gas throttle that connected to cable. Um, had a mechanical cable to pull the slide. Now it still has a cable hooked up, but it's just an electrical cable. This is just a potentiometer, really. So when I turn this, based on the value, the controller um, sends with the according amount of power to the rear hub. Uh, I also, the controller is pretty cool. It's got parameters in there where I can have it when I'm hitting the gas, it's full power to the rear hub. And then as I let go of the gas, it goes to full regen mode. So the there's braking within the hub motor that sends current back in and recharges the battery. And that can all be adjusted. Um, you can adjust the current value on it for feel to how you like it. So when you have full regen on this, you almost don't even need to use either the brakes at all, which is pretty cool, super efficient machine. This horn is the last part of the project I have to do. Um, since I have a DC-DC converter, it does not isolate the high voltage from the low voltage side, which means it has a common ground. The tail light, headlight, all that stuff is not grounded directly to the frame, so that all functions. This is grounded directly to the frame, and I want to isolate that because if I were to touch this main positive and the frame, I would get shocked. So I need to run this horn and isolate the ground and bring it into a wire directly rather than the frame, just like the headlight and taillight are. So tucked up here near the frame tube of the recess for the gas tank, it's actually not that visible at all, that's why I tucked it all up there, um, is the main wiring harness and then all this is just excess stuff for the controller that I don't use at all. This, I mean, you can control brake lights and stuff like that off the controller, but I already had the original wiring harness for the bike. This is the Bluetooth module for the controller, so I can change parameters off of an app on my phone. If I want to limit top speed or change the regen or anything like that, I can do it just like that, super simple. Since I got rid of the foot brake, that used to pull a switch to turn on the brake light when the foot brake's activated. Uh, instead, I tapped the wiring off of this new um, rear brake handle 
same exact same exact thing. I ran these wires directly into there, and it runs the exact same way. The BMS inside of here that uh, has all the battery information I have running directly to that screen. It can also run purely off Bluetooth, and you can just check it off your phone to see how much charge you have left and stuff like that. But instead, I opted for the $30 hardwired screen so I could see it directly on there, so you can have it's much easier to access. So I went that route. To mount the battery box, I used the original engine mounts here, and I welded together some angled brackets for it to rest on and then screw it into here. Up here I did a similar thing. I made a special bracket off the airbox bracket, screwed directly into here. And then for the last mount, this is another original engine mount where I made a bracket and then screwed up and under. So I had three points of contact. The only modifications I had to do directly to the frame were right here. There used to be another mount and I chopped that flat for clearance so that I could fit my battery in here. But this is actually a half inch narrower from foot peg to foot peg than uh, the gas engine was. So it fits really well overall. Overall this bike weighs 20 pounds less than the stock gas bike and I'm willing to bet it is much better handling because all of the weight is down low by the battery just like where the engine was and now I don't have any weight and gas fluid up top so my overall center of gravity is much lower and also no weight and fluid up top in this oil tank. This is a 3.6 kilowatt hour battery pack overall that I get 50 to 60 miles on. Uh, when you do the math that's about 15 miles per kilowatt hour. Here in Utah um, it costs 10 to 12 cents per kilowatt hour, so this costs less than one cent per mile um, to ride. Um, that means this is probably the cheapest high-speed single occupancy transportation uh, on the planet, really. Um, an e-bike technically uses less energy, but it won't go 55 miles an hour like this will. So that was kind of my goal, is to make the most efficient, energy-efficient, single person transportation in terms of cost. So overall this bike will go 55 miles an hour. Um, you can pick all sorts of different speeds based on your hub. They're all gonna, all the hubs will have the same power but the KV ratio changes that. So if I want to go faster, I end up having less torque overall. Um, if I want crazy amounts of torque, I don't have as much top speed. So 55 I thought was a pretty good balance. This thing isn't crazy torquey. Um, it's probably similar to what the stock gas bike was. Um, but you could change that. You could drop in a, a 5,000 watt hub and get a much more powerful controller and then this thing will be absolutely ripping. Probably only for $500 or less. Um, I made this, my goal was a, the most budget build possible. So I got all of the best components that I could get for a reasonable price. And that's what this ended up with. So this was a pretty sweet project overall. I'll go through the breakdown of all the costs to show you how much this cost and how much time I spent on it. So you can see I have every single time I spent a half hour on the bike here and every single item I purchased here. So rather than bore you and go through every single detail, so you can see the total amount of time I logged was 61 and a half hours. This is all while doing physical work. Um, this doesn't include when I was designing things on a computer. So essentially if I were to do this again, it would be at most 61 and a half hours. Likely more like 40 because I'd be way more efficient second time around. I grouped them into areas of time spent. So picking up the bike was two hours, cleaning the bike was three and a half, stripping all the gas parts off that I don't need and listing them on eBay was six hours, rebuilding the fork and putting on new rear shocks is an hour, uh, the battery, putting the battery together and the battery box together, and that was 22 hours of work. That was like over a third of the entire time spent was the battery. Mounting the rear hub, making those brackets and welding and all that stuff was six hours. Mounting the charger and controller on top of the battery was two hours. 
And then mounting the battery to the bike, I showed all those custom brackets I had made. That was 13 hours. So just getting the battery in here alone was like over 60% of the time I spent. And then finally wiring up the cables and getting the DC-DC connected and getting all the lights working and programming the controller was seven hours. That was surprising to me. I thought the electrical part was going to be a lot more work. Um, I'm a mechanical guy. I thought that was going to take me a lot more time, but almost all the work was mounting the battery and building the battery. Then for costs, I'll scroll back up. I bought the bike for $250. The title was $22. And then because I stripped off all the gas parts, they're all vintage parts that sell really well because people can't buy them anymore. They're from the 70s, 50 years old. Um, I managed to sell almost $600 in parts. So just buying the bike and selling parts, I made money. So the bike itself, I, I made $320 doing that. And then same thing, I grouped all the categories here. So new tires and mounting the tires because they were old rotted tires on there was 160. Uh, getting the new fork components and the new rear shocks was 130. All the electrical stuff, so this includes all the cables, the DC-DC converter, the lights, anything like that, was $250. Here was a kicker. Um, the motor and controller getting that shipped from China, that alone was $500. So that was a quarter of the cost of my entire project was just shipping the motor and the controller. Now, the motor and controller were incredibly cheap, 210 for the motor, 150 for the controller. Um, you could easily get twice as powerful motor controller for a couple hundred dollars more each, but my goal was to make this as budget as possible. The charger was 130 could also get a more expensive, faster charger, but this is the best bang for your buck to be able to charge at one kilowatt. The battery in terms of the aluminum and the BMS and the cells themselves was 600. So the battery and shipping was well over half the cost of the entire project. Uh, miscellaneous stuff. And then tools were $122. So this includes like things that I had to buy, specialty tools in order to make some parts. So in the tools is a tablet that I needed a special Android tablet because my phone wouldn't accept it to program the controller. I got a 60 volt power supply to be able to charge up the cells and level them all out and an oscillating tool um, for cutting parts. So this probably shouldn't even be included in there, but I included it anyways. But all in all, just over $2,000 to get this project done and 60 hours of work. Um, granted, a lot of this isn't including, um, I have access to a mill and a lathe and a welder and stuff like that, so I didn't have to outsource and pay for any of that. But this is just to show you that it can be done for fairly cheap to get a really cool bike that's really functional for not a whole lot of money. People out online will tell you you need to buy all these insane components, and you can if you want crazy performance. But if you're doing a budget build um, with still quality but low-cost parts, $2,000 is, is, is really good.